Hello, welcome again to Senior On Care TV. My name is Dr. Abraham Fatiha, and uh, now we are continuing discussing uh, pain management for the lower back regions. And as we got closer to the spinal discs, and as I said previously mentioned to you, that spinal discs, the, in, the intervertebral disc, the disc that sits in between the two vertebras, um, is avascular for sure and it has no blood supply and once it's injured it will heal within 48 hours however it can cause some impingement on the spinal cord as you see on the diagram right over here and a new nerve root as well however it has been revealed it has been revealed that the facet the articulation as you see the vertebral body over the vertebral body there is an articulation that those articulations that are encapsulated those are considered joint and encapsulated with ligament and is innervated highly innervated by nociceptors those nociceptors are uh, you know causing signals transmit signals into the spinal cord the spinal cord transmitted into the brain the brain will trans uh, will translate this code uh, and muscle guard and a re end result is a muscle spasm of the region however surgery is is usually not re not required and it's not recommended and it's never been recommended and it will never be recommended and it will never be successful not in here to attack any industry or any orthopedic surgeries spinal surgeries is only only uh you know recommended on a very few cases okay and some of those cases to be mentioned when uh the injury when the spinal spinal pain or the lower back pain is closely related to urinary incontinence when there is no voluntarily no voluntary uh, urine uh, output just only a urinary incontinent the person will have to have a brief this is not happening because of any other uh, reason but because of uh, nerve root compression that can cause that urinary or fecal and or fecal incontinence well this has happened but it's rare to happen rare very rare to happen okay loss of sensation of one part of the body could happen but not is rare to say and I haven't seen and I've seen some but it's because a nerve entrapment means a nerve entrapment not because of the nerve the nerve root is the peripheral nerve entrapped okay just like uh, the nerve root right over here C C6 C7 let's say when they join they give uh, ulnar nerve C6 C7 T1 okay the the nerve root that comes out of the C7 between the C6 and the C7 there is a nerve root comes out and it gives a, a nerve that they can join and cause an ulnar nerve to be formed sometimes the ulnar nerve get entrapped somewhere in the elbow and the person can lose sensation they, they will experience numbness tingling sensation the same thing happened to be in the lower extremity with the lower back surgery happened not to be on the neck or the lower back but supposed to be happening on the out on the periphery that would be fine but spinal surgery is not recommended and is really 75 to 80 uh, percent of the time spinal surgery uh, result in failed back surgery syndrome and that's a very big huge problem that is not going to be treated by conservative therapy alone solo and just would be only treated by a high opioid medications such as like not even a Tylenol 3 it's a Vicodin hydrocodone and with, with acetaminophen 500 5 500 7.5 uh, 500 
10 milligram of opioid hydrocodone with 325 milligram of acetaminophen. Um, Percocet, which is composed of oxycodone with acetaminophen, that can range from 5 milligram, 325 milligram with acetaminophen up to 10, 325. And using those medications in the long term would make the person addicted to it. Not only addicted to it, but they, all, they also would need a higher dosages to reach the desired goal of pain relief. And if in case they get lower dosage, it will end up with a breakthrough pain. And breakthrough pain is a very bad pain that, um, according to American Medical Association, will need to treat it with a dose and a half to overcome that episode of breakthrough pain. So a lot of people get hospitalized because of that. Because they try to lower down on the dosage and then, you know, they flare up with the pain. So surgery is a hardware surgery. What surgery, most surgeries of the spine do, if we get back to the, to the graph that we have, I'm going to show you very simple. It is really a simple hardware, but it needs a neurosurgeon, an orthopedic surgeon. Okay, and it's really dangerous as it gets closer into uh, the head, the brain. And if, if it's in the neck, it's really dangerous. If it's in the lower back, it's dangerous, but not as much as the neck because the lower back, um, the spinal cord, the end of the spinal cord is between the second and the third vertebra. The rest is innervated by the tail, okay, by the tail of the spinal cord. So the operation is really if it's involved with the spinal nerve root, what they do, they would release it. How would they release it? They would do a disectomy first. They will take the disc that sits on the vertebral body, the one that we talked about that gets dried up. They take it out. And what they do, they cut off also the lamina. You see the lamina, the spoke, the spoke that comes out. They cut it off and they cut off the other one. And what they do, they fuse the two vertebras together with wires. And that's called a spinal stabilization. Usually the surgery it's, has a very long recovery. First of all, it's like about a one week of hospitalization. Person will be a bed bound. Uh, lots of people, whether they have a neck or, for lo or lower back surgery, would experience a urinary uh, hesitancy or urgency or they will not be able to urinate just because it's a reflex that is not known and could not be explained so right now in the setting of operating on the lower back or the neck region they get a urologist to be on board not only a neurosurgeon so there are many kinds of complications that could result from neck or lower back surgeries and most most probably is not going to result with success rate because even if the pain is removed which is not com which is not completely is not guaranteed to be removed completely there will be some residual pain there will be also some residual weakness neurological weakness that not, that could not be reversed is irreversible in addition to those two, two or three years down the road, just because of the stabilization with the wire, degenerative joint disease start to act up because it's a bone on a bone and stabilized with the wire. Range of motion will be decreased significantly due to surgical stabilization, not because of pain, not because of a muscle spasm. Not because of degenerative joint disease. It's just because that segment has to be one. Okay? It's just like a long torque versus a short torque. Torque. Okay? In addition to that, if there is a long torque, okay, with the movement, since the movement is going to be impaired, the kinetic chains is also will be impaired. They will start to have a headache. They will start to have a shoulder pain. They will start to have... Um, abnormality with the gait, with the way how they walk, 
the person will start to walk differently. At the beginning, it's very guarded movement. But as the time goes on, to cope with that surgery, they will start to have different things moving, different muscles move, and the others not. So there are a lot of problems can go on. People can stay on opioid forever. And staying on opioid medications is not life. It's not life at all. Person will be dependent. It's just like a drugs. I mean, I'm not saying that pharmaceutical is a drugs. It's a drugs. It's a medications that should be used some certain ty time of your life, and that will be it. This is not when you have to take a blood pressure medication. You stay on it. You stay on it for the rest of your life because you need it. Okay, we're talking about opioid. We're talking about controlled substances. Things that can make you faint. Okay? It has a lot of problems in it also. People get constipated very often. They don't have a bowel movement more than once every two, three days. In addition to that, uh, they will start to mix it with an over-counter medications that can make it a synergistic effect and make it even a higher dosage in your body. Okay? So it is really not a recommendation to do. I just said that it's medication to be taken just for the first 10 to 15 days until you start to roll. So we give you a boost for you to start on conservative therapy, you know, and, 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 and just to relieve your pain while you are on conservative therapy treatment. And once we get we get you into conservative therapy, that's it, we have you. And you'll be on. So, I mean, it's better not to consider surgery at any time. Unless it is really very, very little points. Urinary and or fecal incontinence, yes, you would consider it. And if it's the, 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 the cause is really the definitive the lower back pain or the neck is really the definitive cause for the urinary and or fecal incontinence. Paralysis or weakness, weakness, muscle atrophy, the muscle circumference will get smaller. Okay? That's when you consider it. Other, uh, you know, in, in, in any other scenarios is not supposed to be considered. It's not something that we can do a procedure and we can go on. Please do not think about it like that. And, and you should really, when you go to a physician and you are recommended surgery, you should think about it and you take it another opinion. Gentle care, as we said, heating pad, taking like, you know, light medications as recommended by your physician if it's not contraindicated. You know, there are some physicians who gives you medications. They will tell you, this is the start and please go on the conservative therapy. That's nothing wrong with that. Or sometimes it's not, you're not a good fit for conservative therapy. So maybe you can do a gentle care or home care exercise on your own. And it will be better. That's fine. That's good. Stretching exercises, I told you, to stretch the buttock muscles. Just put one leg on the top of each other and bend forward. Or if you are in a laying posi lying position, just put one leg on the top of the other and raise up both of them toward to your chest. And keep breathing. Do not hold your breath. And count it. There is some pain, but overcome with that pain. Don't worry, nothing wrong would happen. Okay? Heat along with heat. Laying on your side. The affected side should be up. And gentle massage. If it does not work for you, the massage, don't do it. Trigger point injection, I don't see any literature would recommend a trigger point injection. Dr. Travell, who invented trigger point, and I personally have all the series of Dr. Travell, never heard from Dr. Travell um, to inject trigger points. So I really don't know and I have no knowledge about what is the benefit of doing trigger point injection. I can do it. I'm authorized to do it, but I won't do it because that would cause more pain. Okay, and irritation of the muscle and soft tissues. So there is no reason for that. And 
in regards to the epidural injection, I guess if you're really, really in need of such an epidural injection because it's inflamed, so I would consider asking the doctor, doctor, would you consider giving a corticosteroid uh, regimen for five days or ten days? And there, there are packs, pack that's for ten days and is given in a split doses for the first day, second day, first day is a high dosage, second day is lower, 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 lower until they get none. And, and that would be maybe more effective. Just take it auto, just take it by mouth instead of injecting it. There's no difference. There is no reason of injecting corticosteroid right into a very delicate space a space that you do not even want to mess with it. It's really hard and tough and that would lead into a lot of consequences if anything could ever happen. So just take a corticosteroid. Corticosteroid injection that is prescribed by a physician. Take it to the pharmacist. You will get it. You'll take it and that's it. And you make sure that you will have a good food as you take it. And that will be it, the end of the case, if you consider it this way. And continue with your conservative therapy, should you like to. Because your pain will be wiped out at the end. It's a wonderful life, right? Isn't it? We have everything ready. Lower back pain and exercises. Well, swimming in a warm water is really rec recommended is really recommended. If you swim in a warm water, first of all, why is it swimming? Swimming because it's a non-weight bearing, right? As I explained in the beginning, that lower back is a weight bearing area. So swimming, it will make your body float, right? You float as you swim and it's warm water. So you're moving your lower back and the joint in the warm water. That will give such a good harmony to all of your joints in your body. Water aerobic. Why is it water aerobic? Because water can make you float. It's a non-weight bearing. Williams flexion exercises. I don't know how many people would follow this, but it's just like that. And as I explained before, here is your hip. Okay? And imagine that you have a wire or anything that goes from one side of your body to the other and what would you do is you keep breathing and this is your stomach right over here and what you need to do is you need to raise it up but without using the thigh muscles so what do you do in and out you're gonna make it more clear like this you see my fingers on the two bony prominences that I have and tilt it back. You need to keep breathing, keep breathing, open your mouth and keep breathing and you let it down. That what it would do, this is such a wonderful exercise to do because what it would do, it will strengthen your abdominal muscles and stretch your back muscles too. So that will increase the stabilization of your lower back and a lumbar spine region. Flexion, William flexion exercises is wonderful. Is wonderful. You can do it also in the same thing in a lying position. You can do it in a standing position. Whatever you want to do it. The more like 15 reps three times a day, it would be wonderful. And you'll see yourself different. Not for, for, from the first day, you need to give it a little bit of time. Massage, deep soft tissue massage of hips and upper buttocks help. Yes, of course, but you need to be careful because when you do the hip massage, when you do the hip massage, this is your hip right over here, right? This is the hip. And how do you know it's a hip in here? It's just only move your leg. And you will know that it's a ball, like it's moving. So take it as, as an origin point, And what you need to do is spread out the second one right over here right across the buttock region you want to avoid you want to avoid you want to avoid this region right over here because that's where the sciatic nerve runs okay 
So you need to move out of that area, above. So you need to massage here, 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 here. You do it on your own. You do it on your own and you get an instant back pain relief. Instant. Again, is this is your hip right over here. Keep moving it like that. You see the hip is moving. And then what you need to do is you need to spread the other finger. And right in the middle, this is where the sciatic nerve goes. In between, the sciatic nerve goes in here. So move it. Stay up. That's what we do injections. And that's what we do the massages. Right over here. And especially in here. If you feel a back pain radiating toward the here, here, weak, tired, very fatigued, once you do that, it will stop. That's a very big trick. And that's what I do personally. And I put off the pain immediately. Important, avoid the pressure on the sciatic nerve. I told you where the sciatic nerve runs through. Just don't touch it. Just stay away from that. Okay? Weight loss, you know, gradually, you need to gradually, you know, gradually lose the weight, not try to away, not to take any amphetamines or any other medications or any other stuff, just, you know, to watch a diet. Watching diet can help, help you a lot, especially controlling diabetes, high cholesterol, high triglyceride and others. So losing weight and maintaining a healthy diet can help can help you not only with your lower back in general, your health status in general, endocrine and gastrointestinal as well, and your breathing pattern will be different. Middle back pain, as I told you, is 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 a twelve vertebra that we were born with it with a curve. It's congenital. That curve is like that. Okay? It's called kyphotic curve. This is the curve that we were born with it. You see it right in the middle. Up, there is a cervical spine. It's composed of seven vertebra. And then you see that curve like that. This is the kyphotic curve. And then the lumbar spine is the same curve as the, the, the cervical spine. Usually pain in that region right over here in the middle, back, that pain is usually radiated from the neck or lower back or is because there is an issue in the gallbladder, cholelysteasis, gallbladder that could be filled with stones. That's mostly it. When females, usually more than male, who more than males, who eat fat food and they have the cholelysteasis, they feel middle back pain. That could be the reason. Okay, so middle back pain is taken as a reference as a reference of something is happening, whether it's a neck, lower back, liver, uh, gallbladder, okay, um, and it could be in the back, the, the lower on the six and the seven vertebra on the lower, if there is a tenderness in there, it could be as a sign of a lower tract infection. Okay, but usually is this lower urine tract infection can give pain on the lower back, very, very, very lower back at the end. Will you see what is this box? The box right at the end, at the bottom of this box, right over there, there will be a tenderness in both sides, right there. You will see the pain right there, on both sides. Usually lower back, and accompanied also with chills and and going. And, and, and going with chills and they have also pallidipsia and, and you know they, they, wanna, they get thirsty a lot and they go to restroom a lot so that will give you some signs and symptoms that there is an infection in there especially among young females okay neck pain often associated with shoulder pain and a headache Okay, if somebody has a shoulder tendonitis where the shoulder rotator cuff muscles, the muscles that connect the shoulder into our body is inflamed due to a fall or a trauma right there in the back, you see it is a supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, okay, and the long head of the biceps 
is also another and a subscapularis which is inside subscapularis those are the rotator cuff muscles those are considered the muscles that stabilize the shoulder into your body. See this very clear beautiful diagram. See that? So sometimes dysfunction on the shoulder or having pain in the shoulder as a result of the trauma can give pain into the, into, uh, into the neck or vice versa. The neck pain can give shoulder pain. It's more common because most of the muscles that originate from the neck right there you see it is also inserted on the shoulder all right and a headache why is it a headache well a lot of people they complain of headache when they sit down for a long time they bend forward and they start to have oh my god I have a headache and you'll see right over here there is a suboccipitals at the at the top of the neck region there is suboccipital muscles is right underneath the occiput it's also there are nerves in there and can give pain okay and this is called the cervicogenic headache cervicogenic headache and people take Tylenol, Advil, all kinds and the pain doesn't go away and they think oh this is a migraine well it looks like a migraine but it's not a migraine it's connected to the muscles at the back of the uh, skull inserted to the neck and the neck gets spasm, muscle spasm. So manipulation and stretching of the neck, uh, stretching the muscles of the neck region and manipulation of the facets can make this pain go away. Okay. Neck pain most probably one side hurts more than the other. I mean it cannot be both. Okay? One side hurts more than the other and then switch back and forth, back and forth. And don't be amazed that a neck pain can shoot right in the middle, right in the middle of your back, which is the upper segments of the thoracic spine, the middle back region. Okay? It can shoot right down there. And it feels like a knife stab. That comes from the neck. Often caused by the lower segment of the cervical spine. If we see the cervical spine region, and if you see, this is the cervical spine back aspects. Well, actually, the last two from the bottom, but this is on the x-rays. The first one on the left is the x-rays, okay? And you see on the x-rays right over here, okay? Usually, usually, if you count from the last one at the bottom, to the up. The last one on the bottom, I can tell you, this is C5. Okay? C5, C4. So usually, the last C4, C5, and C6, those are the most movable segments of the cervical spine. So when you bend your neck, the most movement that happen, the range of motion, comes out of the C4, C5, C6. Okay? When you bend forward, backwards, you move it from one side to the other. Those are the most movable segment. And those, when the trauma happened, happen to be at that region. And when you want to treat the cervical spine and manipulate those regions, you manipulate C4, C5, C5, C6. Or C71, which is a junction of between the cervical spine and the thoracic spine. And this is very challenging. Really challenging. Because when you go for a junction between one region to another, it's very stiff and rigid. But it can go if you treat the muscle very well. And those three segments are the main for causing problems. The life-threatening matters, life-threatening, is the upper, upper, upper one that you see is like a butterfly on the extras on the left. That one right over there. Injury of those segments can cause paralysis. God forbid to come through it. But injury of the lower ones cause problems and pain. Persistent. Moving on. Neck pain treatment is pretty much the same thing. We support it. Soft cervical color at the onset of pain. I mean, when you put a cervical color, please do not allow it to rest on you more than two days. And that will be it. Because you will cause more stiffness. Okay, 
you put it in just for a support until we figure out that there is nothing on the x-ray there is no fractures there is no dislocation otherwise you don't need it lots of people coming into my office with the neck brace and we have to take it out so the first thing before I, you know I tell them hi hello and then I proceed with taking that out and they're looking at me what the hell I am doing well what I am doing right now is I'm letting you to move is it time for you to move it because I look at the x-ray results there is no fracture it's the negative go ahead let's see how can you move now gentle heat heat is always okay I told you this is from heaven heat can increase the, you know you put it on the on the neck muscles it can increase the blood flow okay it can increase the blood flow and break up the muscle spasm exercise to stabilize the shoulder you know there are a lot of people who do dumbbell and things like that well actually this is not a shoulder exercises even if you get a big book of muscles like over here on the biceps that means shows me that your shoulder are very unstable the rotator cuff muscles that I told you at the beginning yeah you see those shoulder muscles those are the muscles that should be strengthened stretched and strengthened you see those muscles if those muscles are strengthened then you have the shoulder stabilized but to have a bulk of muscle right over here that's not a good either either there are lots of people it's very common to find that people got no muscle no supraspinatus right upper, upper fossa the muscle is very thin to none why because they just don't use it and they don't strengthen it they just do a dumbbell like that to strengthen one what about the other they get it weak and atrophied so exercise to stabilize shoulder is a very important thing and stabilize also the the neck is very important and how would you do that you just stabilize one hand down and then what you do you do like that and always the neck movement is always coupled It's always coupled it's not one it's coupled if you see like that you see look you, you put the your hand on top of your ear you stabilize the shoulder okay and what do you do is you tilt it this way and then move it forward and then turn it and you feel the tension you see it's three movements in one it's not like the lower back okay tractioning of the neck with heating pad and towel is very good it's, it's really nice and how would you do that you just put you just get a heating pad you put it in a towel okay or you get a hot towel and then you wrap it up and then you put it behind you and then you do like that and you pull on the shoulder hopefully you don't choke yourself you got to be careful okay and make it when while you are sitting don't do it when you are standing please because you faint okay use a soft pillow at night time no matter how much does it cost is the pillow is expensive no cheap ones are okay just change it frequently and it will be fine there's nothing is superior than the other it's just only a pillow neck pain medications is the same thing you can take Tylenol Advil you know but you better ask your nurse or or a physician if this is a good fit for you because you don't want to cause any other problems like a GI tract irritation heartburn um, ulcerations and others so you got to be careful you need to get a medical advice <clears throat> over-the-counter creams or gels such as biofreeze biofreeze Bengay whatever you just need to get it what do you need to, to make sure when you put that you do it as you stretching and please do not take a hot shower after applic applying those creams you need to take a hot shower before if you want to but not after because the reason those creams tends to have mint and it will cause burn up on application of a hot water so please do not use it along with heat either or you use the heat then you use the cream and that's it you stop right there you, you want to use Tylenol Advil as I said to you previously that using Tylenol, uh, Tylenol uh, because is an is a central nervous system acting 
it will it will inhibit some of your pain and you want to use Advil or ibuprofen actually let's not say brand names because they're all the same ibuprofen and look at the dosage very well okay based on your body weight and based on what you are used to okay so the anti-inflammatory medication is to clean up is is really to wipe out the inflammation from outside and the Tylenol to inhibit the pain receptors that's why you want to use it in synergistic effect both of them however there are some people who got a, a predisposing pre-existing factor that they have a heartburn or they have something that's called gastroesophageal reflux like GERDs GERDs gastroesophageal reflux uh, and or ulceration, they would use something like a Celebrax or Mobeg because what's the difference between ibuprofen versus Celebrax and Mobeg that ibuprofen is a cyclooxygenase 1 and 2. Celebrax and Mobeg are cyc uh, cyc cyclooxygenase 2 inhibitors. So ibuprofen is cyclooxygenase 1 and 2 inhibitors versus a Celebrex amobic is cyclooxygenase 2. It's called, it's called COX-2 inhibitors. Okay? It's a little bit more modified. However, please, please do not use a prescribed medication with the over-counter medication because you will end up with catastrophes at the end. Please, do not do that. And ask your physician if you need to do. Because usually, Celebrex is given once a day. And people take it during the day and they feel like you want, they want to use more medication, they start to take ibuprofen. Well, that's an overdosage, not because of an overdosage, because of anything, because of a pleasure, is because it will cause a GI bleed, gastrointestinal bleed. You start to have an internal bleeding, God forbid. And this is a life threatening matter. You know, we moving toward wellness, then you get hospitalized. Use prescribed pain medication only short term. What I mean by short term, if you are given an opioid, please make sure not to overdose on these things, number one. And number two, it's only for short term. Do not rely on it because opioid receptors will need more and more in your, on, in your head. Okay? Today, if you use one, you use one, you use one, you use one, one day you're going to have, you're going to use two. And then you're going to use three. And if you stop using it, you start to have a breakthrough pain. Then you will need a dosage and a half, as originally. And then you, you move toward addiction. And especially with those popular medications that abuse, abuse medications, oxycodone. Okay? Or hydrocodone. Those are very popular to be abused. Especially among young uh, population. And this is really a shame.